Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for all coming down and joining us this evening. We've got a fabulous turnout and we've got an extremely fabulous guest. I'd like to welcome all of you who are here at Surfer the Bar this evening and also all of you who are joining us online live tonight at surfertheBar.com. And we will have a little time later on to take some questions from our cyber viewers and those can be sent through to talkstory at surfertheBar.com. But tonight I'm super, super excited. You've been watching the great imagery, timeless imagery here of endless summer. And I'm wondering if there's anyone here who was not raised first, second, or even third generation on endless summer. If you haven't seen it yet, how dare you? <laughs> Get out there and grab a DVD. It's a fabulous movie. It is timeless. There's uh, only one thing you'll be missing watching it, and that's the um, very memorable commentary that comes along with it but we've got better than that we've got the original commentator here to talk to you about it so I'd like to introduce the man himself please come up and join me Mr. Bruce Mr. <laughs> I'm looking at him and I'm forgetting his last name Mr. Bruce Brown <laughs> thank you I forget my last name a lot of times too <laughs> You'd think it was a difficult one, right? There's no excuse for me for getting brown. You know, the last time I went to one of those, these things, excuse me for not ask, letting you ask me a question, but it was some one of them surfer things where they're honoring the, you know, the, the modern surfers. And for some reason, I got in there. I think it was because, you know, the last living old guy or something. Anyway, all these surfers are going, and I'd like to thank my sponsor, and they're going on and on. I'm thinking, sponsor? Geez, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Do you get money for that or what, you know? Anyway, when my turn finally came right at the end, I figured they, they probably didn't even know who I am, you know? Anyway, I said, I'd like to thank my sponsor. There was a big silence, said, Social Security. <laughs> so. Well, you're definitely up from that tonight. <laughs> so here we are at the next, the next function. Well, all of these people are not here incidentally, Bruce. They're here to see you tonight, so. You're the man they came to see. Well, so. I wanted to check in with you on Endless Summer because I rang my mom in Australia and I said, oh my God, you're not gonna believe who's coming in this Wednesday. It's Bruce Brown. And uh, I was raised on Endless Summer and in fact she said, you better tell him that the reason why you're sitting there doing what you do and how you were born in South Africa was because of that darn movie. So <laughs> my parents were in Australia, caught the endless summer in the 60s, caught the bug and said, we've got to go find that perfect wave in South Africa. So you touched those people around the world back then. You know, there, there's, a, there's a kid in Australia that the endless summer affected in the same way. And I ran into a few years back in his uh, the name of David Hill. And it turned out that David went to work for Rupert Murdoch and did the Formula One racing and did this and did that. And I talked from time to time. And uh, he was head of like Fox Sports for a while. So I had some friend that had some sporting event that, I, so I call up David and say, hey man, could you get this, my friend's event on television? He goes, I don't do sports anymore. I go, oh, they canned you. Well, you know, they're good for them. You know, you're a worthless little shit anyway. Anyway, he goes, no, I'm ahead of the whole thing. And I went, why would you do that? I mean, need money? I mean, do you get a lot of time off? I mean, what the, what's wrong with you? Anyway, so, you know, it's funny through the years how different people, you know, show up that saw that movie and, and, uh, and it had some effect on them. Sure did. But... But a lot of people, I mean, a lot. some of my best friends go, that movie was a piece of crap. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I, I go, well, I don't, don't argue with them. It was a whole movie. What do you expect? <laughs> All right. Well, I wanted to ask you about when you came um, early 60s, I think it was like 63, 64, and you brought your film. Firstly, how long did it take you to edit down everything that you had shot around the world? <laughs> well, um, not long, because, I mean, yeah, I mean, it always takes long, but there wasn't that much footage, you know, because we, I just had a suitcase with like 50, 100 foot rolls of film in it. So it wasn't like 10,000 feet of film. 
But, uh, and then we showed Endless Summer just on the regular lecture circuit where I, you know, you firstly narrate it on the stage and dodge the bottle caps and all that stuff. And, and, uh, and then, you know, it was so popular that we thought, well, we'll, we'll uh, be great to, if we get in theaters, then we don't have to go every night, you know, to show it. We could just sit home and watch TV and <laughs> get some money, you know. Because you were narrating it every night as well, right? I mean, you but went all to... Of, yeah, all of, you know, Hollywood type. Oh, God, nobody's going to walk that thing within five feet of the ocean. Yeah, blah, blah, you know. <laughs> They're just starting to piss me off, you know, so... <laughs> so we rented a theater in Wichita, Kansas in the middle of the winter and showed it still in 16 millimeter. And it, it, it played for two weeks in the middle of a blizzard and sold out every night, broke the theater record that was held by My Fair Lady. So I'm thinking, well, that'll show those guys that it's, you know, it'll work away from the ocean. But, eh, what do those people in Wichita know? These are the New York distributor smart guys. So we, because we'd done it for years, we just went to New York, rented a theater, and said, uh, well, let's show it ourselves. And we blew it up to 35 millimeter, which took every cent we had. To, you know, to you know, from the bank, and uh, and it opened there in the first week. It broke the theater record. The second week, the business went down. The third week, it broke the record of the first week, which was unheard of. In, you know, on the booby. So, at that point, we thought, now we're going to get some distributor because you know we we were just. Being surfers, going, yeah, we're thinking of starting our own distribution company, and we're just shining them on, you know. And uh, we're getting calls from, like, Joseph E. Levine. Mr. Levine would like to see your movie. Well, great, come to the theater. Oh, he doesn't go to movie theaters. You know, you got to send a print to, you know, to New Jersey. And we're going, we only got one print. They ain't leaving the theater, you know. <laughs> anyway, the... Uh, then we finally got it, and everybody wanted the posters no good. You got to re edit, put more chicks in it, and all this stuff that they wanted to do, you know, that I knew was going to ruin it, whatever it was. But they, they uh, we finally found a guy that said he figured out how much we were in debt, said, I'll give you this much up front, and we won't, we'll just leave it, we won't change a thing. And I went, cool, signed me up, and uh, played in that theater in New York for a year. And got all kinds of publicity <laughs> that uh, that brought the IRS down on me. <laughs> Funny how that happens. All the publicity said he's a rich guy now. You know what? I wasn't rich, and but they thought I was rich. So I, they went back to all my old surf films, and I guess you're supposed to you're supposed to capitalize them. Well, we just had a you know we had a book that said in and out. You know, money came in and money went out. But I guess with a movie, you weren't supposed to do that. You had to capitalize <laughs> it. And only after... Anyway, they, they went back for all those years, all my... And I'm going, I couldn't even make another movie if I had to... Couldn't Ducking. deduct what I spent. Anyway, they just nailed me for a bunch of money. And I went up to Santa Ana to pay them. The guy goes, boy's been a big fan of your films. <laughs> And I went, well, what, you know, this is BS, you know, what, what's the deal? And the guy goes, well, I'm just doing my job. You know, well, get another job or something. <laughs> I was so pissed off, I walked out, slammed the door, the glass and the door broke. Oh, no. I'm like, you know, <laughs> hot put it down the hall. Well, Endless Summer wasn't your first film or your last, but you seem to have a very um, firm idea of what it represented, even, as you say, in the artwork of the movie poster, not change, not deviating from your idea there. Did you have some knowledge, just in your own inklings, that it was going to be that kind of a monumental, enduring film while you were filming and producing it? Well, if I understood you right, which I'm not sure I did, but... Uh, I had no formal training mm -hmm. at all. Got on a, a plane to Hawaii in 1958 with a book, How to Make Movies. And uh, Belzy put up 5,000 bucks, you know, to make the first movie, Slippery When Wet. And, uh, but it just, you know, how do you get the job done? 
And I always thought, I'd like to go to film school so I'd learn, you know, how to make a movie. And uh, years later, I get a call from USC going, could you come and talk to the, the film students? And I went, yeah, yeah, that'd be bitching. At the time, I was thinking, God, I, I thought I might go there to learn something. But. So, and before I went there, I had a, had a meet with this guy, Bob Evans, who was head of Paramount Pictures. And he goes, because they thought I had some secret formula for a, chi a cheap-ass movie to make a bunch of money. <laughs> so I knew that. You know, and he goes, well, what are, you, what are you doing next? And I'm thinking, well, I don't know. I'm thinking, first of all, I'm going surfing. And then I'm thinking maybe a movie about commercial fishing. And he goes, commercial fishing? And I went, yeah. He goes, do you want any financing? I went, you know, if I had to come to you before the end of summer, there's no way you would even talk to me. And now you think I got some <laughs> secret thing to make you some money, so now I'm your pal. I go, I'm going to SC this afternoon, talk to students. Why don't you guys like put up a million bucks pick out 10 students to make a, a movie for 100 grand a piece, and, I, and you'll put more young people in the film business than Hollywood done the history of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> so he goes, okay, I'll give you the money. I go, no, 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 I, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't you know. <laughs> anyway, so I, I went and you know, talked to the kids. I, mean, I was the same age as them. But, and they're asking, how'd you do this? How? And they're laughing because everything we did was so unconventional, mm -hmm. you know. Well, what'd you do for a work print? We just showed the original film, you know. Well, how did you do the optical? Well, we had some dye, we just dye it, you know, make the fade outs and stuff. And my wife would run a projector and put her finger in the loop when the <laughs> splices went by so it wouldn't, you know. But anyway, one of the, uh, so I asked the kids, well, how many of you guys think you can make a, you know, a feature film for 100 grand that would make money? And uh, of course, they all raised their hand. <laughs> One of the students was George Lucas. So, so that guy really screwed up by not signing <laughs> up. He didn't learn anything.